Whatever you may think of the value of IQ tests, it is surely relevant to a conversation about equality that as many as 16% of our species have an IQ below 85, while about 2%, but anyway, 16%, what do you want to put up your hands? 16% have an IQ below, below 85, uh, 2% have an IQ above 130. This is a short outtake of the hour-long speech by the former mayor of London, Boris Johnson, at the Margaret Thatcher Lecture in 2013. As he attempts to make a connection between inequality and people's IQ scores, he unintentionally brings up a really interesting question. Does IQ correlate to success? Uh, let's expand that question even further. What does IQ correlate to at all? What does IQ really say, and does it even allow us to accurately predict anything of use, or is the measurement of a person's IQ completely irrelevant? To answer that, we need to understand what an IQ test is designed to measure, and to what extent it succeeds in that measurement. The first IQ test, or intelligence quotient test, where quotient means a particular degree or amount of something, was first created in early 20th century France by Alfred Binet and his colleague as a mean to help decide which students were most likely to experience difficulty in school. This was after France passed laws requiring all children to attend school, and the idea behind this new test was to identify children who needed more help in order to give them more help. Binet theorized the concept of mental age after discovering that certain children were able to continually answer more complex questions than their fellow classmates. This test can be considered the first iteration of the modern IQ test, and is nowadays referred to as the Simone Binet scale. When the test made its way to the United States, a psychologist at Stanford University standardized the test and published it in 1916 as the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. This version of the test used a single number to represent intelligence, that number being the intelligence quotient. Back in 1916, an IQ score was derived from dividing your mental age with your chronological age and multiplying that number by 100. If you, for example, were 18 years old and showed a mental age of 21, you would be assigned an IQ of approximately 117. However, this was only useful for discovering different levels of intelligence amongst kids and young adults, as mental age becomes more redundant the older you get. The development process of the brain diminishes as the person enters adulthood, resulting in the distinction between a 3-year-old and 4-year-old being much more prominent than that between a 30-year-old and 40-year-old. Even though the way we calculate IQ today is different from how it originally began, the IQ number we get today would probably look a lot similar to the ones we would have gotten with the Stanford Binet scale. The new procedure for assigning IQ scores was intentionally made that way, as to give recognizable IQ values from a new system. The way that you get your IQ now is through a standard deviation, more generally known as a bell curve due to the graph's shape. Let's say for example 1000 people the same age as you took an IQ test, and then became the basis for evaluating any future possible test takers in that age group. When viewing the bell curve, you can see that 682 people out of the 1000 will get assigned an IQ between 85 and 115. 136 of them will score between 115 to 130 and so on. This means that if I or you were to take the test, our score on the test would be compared to the base and correct age group, and you would get a similar IQ to people you scored similarly to on the test. This means that IQ today is a relative term that stays numerically relevant in the sense that 160 IQ is damn high today, as it still will be in 100 years, even though we might be significantly more or less intelligent overall. You might have noticed that the bell curve is split up into sections of plus or minus 15 IQ, and you might have wondered why exactly that is. Simply put, this is how the scores match with previous test scoring systems. Technically speaking, we could use deviations of 100 instead of 15. The only thing that would mean is that a person with 115 IQ would now have 200. It doesn't make the person inherently smarter, it just makes every additional digit from 100 less meaningful. This brings us to IQ tests today. You might have seen on your Facebook timeline that some friend of yours shared a post in which it says that they got an IQ score of so and so much. You might have clicked on that post as well just to see what your IQ is, to then find out that you are exceptionally intelligent, hooray, you have an IQ of about 155 plus. You are one of the smartest people on earth. 
here, share this with your friends and accept you probably aren't one of the smartest people on earth. Considering that it is speculated that Stephen Hawking has an IQ of 160, you having an IQ of 155 suddenly doesn't seem too realistic. So what is really going on here? Well, as it turns out, most online IQ tests are designed to make you share it. So that the site generates more clicks and thus more money. It does this by inflating your IQ score. Sites do this in many different ways. Either they flat out add a bunch of IQ points to your score, so say you initially got 116, the site then just adds a flat number to your initial score to make you more prone to sharing it with your friends. Another option is to have a standard deviation of more than 15. The problem here is if you score beneath 100, because that would mean that your score deflates. There are many more ways to do this, but the more complicated the math becomes, the unlikelier it is. In most cases, sites just add a flat number, since from a programming standpoint, that's by far the easiest way. This all implies, however, that the score you got initially is even correct to begin with. You see, there are IQ tests, and then there are IQ tests. If you really want your IQ evaluated, the way you'd go around doing that is to take the test in a controlled environment with a professional psychologist administering it. Contacting Mensa in your country and going that route is usually cheaper, but IQ results from Mensa aren't often accepted for evaluating your psychology in a medical environment. Basically, you need to take a test that can be compared against several other similar tests taken by people at a similar age group. This requires multiple psychologists being in contact to share test results, which requires a lot of time and resources. And I can hear you screaming, well, what about Mensa Online IQ tests? Aren't they legit enough? And well, they are the closest you can come to the real thing without going to a professional, but it isn't enough to be scientifically evaluated. Even though it can give you a good estimation, the Norwegian Mensa test webpage even says that since the test has not been standardized according to professional standards, the results should not be confused with a result obtained on a professional test." Unquote. On the Mensa.org webpage, it is explained even further, having the online IQ test referred to as an intelligence quiz, and that it specifically is not a proper IQ test. So, accounting for all of this with regards to Boris's statement, what relevance does IQ actually have to success? Like, in the real world, is there an actual difference of income in regards to different IQ levels? When looking at a study that came out in 2014 and taking a first look at its statistics, there appears to be a strong correlation between high income and high IQ. Looking at these charts provided by the study, which looks at the median income and net worth, it seems like IQ almost has to be directly connected to income and wealth. However, after taking into account multiple different factors, such as how frequently people are maxing out their credit cards and smoking, just to name a few, the correlation starts to shrink. In fact, after accounting for a total of 34 different factors, the correlation between IQ, wealth and income shrinks to a state of complete insignificance. What this means is that rather than high IQ causing you to have high income and wealth, a person with high income and wealth is more likely to have a higher IQ. Basically, the richer you are, the higher IQ you are likely to have. It's sort of like a polar bear is always white. But that doesn't mean that everything that is white is always a polar bear. Stuff that is white can be other things than just polar bears, just like people who have a high IQ can be other things than just rich. In the end of the study, it is concluded that people who have higher income and wealth are people who are better with money. And the study found no correlation between being good with money and high IQ. The study also stated that these results confine to previous results in similar studies, which even further backs up the conclusions that were made. This doesn't, however, make Boris's claims any less relevant, it just makes them less... true.